Prunella Scales is Sarah France in After Henry by Simon Brett, with Joan Sanderson as Eleanor, Benjamin Whitrow as Russell, and Jerry Cooper as Claire. The Season of Relative Goodwill. Stockings, Russell. I beg your pardon? Stockings. What about them? Do you and Bob have them? Sarah, I know the straight world has some pretty bizarre misconceptions about the gay world. Mm. Uh, but but oh. I can assure you that Bob and I do not have stockings. Oh, sorry, Russell, I didn't mean that. I wasn't implying. <laughs> oh. You knew exactly what I meant. You're having me on, aren't you? <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just such fun when you make a gaffe like that. I mean, you know, not the gaffe itself, but the speed with which you leap in to cover it up and show what a deep-down liberal, tolerant person you are. You are a pig, Russell. <laughs> Yes, I'm sorry. Properly chastened. You were, in fact, talking about Christmas stockings. Yes. And the answer is, no, Bob and I do not have stockings in that sense or any other sense. Ah. I haven't had stockings since I admitted to not believing in Father Christmas. Wasn't allowed to after that. Seems a bit harsh. Well, I grew up in a hard school, sir, and my parents were not of the opinion that one should make a profit from something one didn't believe in. What a rotten principle. Goodness, if you followed that through, there'd be all kinds of repercussions. You'd write off the whole advertising industry for a start. Mm, lose a good few politicians, too. A fair number of romantic novelists. You see, it's not all bad. In fact, I'd say, as a principle, it's got a lot going for it. Oh, but Christmas stockings, Russell. You can't not have stockings. Well, as I said, Bob and I do manage not to have stockings. Yes, shouldn't really have asked. You two manage not to have Christmas. We do our best. Decorating again this year? Mm-hmm. The back bedroom, rather nice pale green, Regency stripe. Be hell to match around the window alcoves. And the whole ring cycle on cassette again? Oh, no, no. No, we thought we'd have something different this year. Oh, what? We're having it on compact disc. Russell. And you? You doing the rounds of your friends again, or going away, or... No. Uh... This year I am going to brave another traditional Christmas. At home? With... Eleanor and Claire? Hmm? Is that wise? I don't know whether it's wise or not. I, I just know I'd feel all cheated if I don't do it. I have this deep-seated need to agonise over my own Brussels sprouts and brandy butter. Of course. Mm. And I know Henry won't be there. But come on, this will be the fourth Christmas since he died, so I think I can cope. I'm not sure I can cope, but there has to come a moment when I can cope. And this year I can cope with the concept of trying to cope. Good. Yes. And um, will you be having a stocking? No. Oh, goodness me, I haven't had a stocking. <laughs> since you were a little girl? Oh, no, since Henry died. What? We used to do them for each other every year. Oh. But you didn't have to pretend to each other that you believed in Father Christmas. No, we weren't brought up under your parents' strict regime. Mm. It must be difficult, you know, running up to Christmas. You know, not getting the stuff for Henry's stocking. Yes, yes it is. I had to concentrate all my firepower on Claire and Mother. What? They get stockings? Oh, yes. Come on, Claire's only 19 going on 20. Well, at Christmas time, 19 going on 5. Well, I suppose that's some kind of excuse for her, but um, what's Eleanor's? Second childhood? Oh, she doesn't need an excuse. Come on, Russell, she's a mere 70 final figure left deliberately vague. Anyway, you take my word for it. They'd both be desolated if they didn't get their stockings. And presumably they don't have to subscribe to my parents' got-to-believe-in-it principle. They don't, but they would. Russell, if those two thought they wouldn't get stockings without it, they'd believe in Father Christmas or the Loch Ness Monster or the Abominable Snowman or the Tory Party Election Manifesto. Ho, ho, ho. All right, whatever you say, Mummy. It is only one day, Claire, love. Yes. You can survive anything for one day. No, you can't. What do you mean? I mean, there are lots of things you can't survive for one day. Being held underwater, for instance. Claire, we are not talking about being held underwater. We are talking about Christmas. Where's the difference? Listen, Claire, you must be more positive about this. You can do what you like on Christmas Eve, you can do what you like on Boxing Day, but Christmas Day we're all going to be here together and the least you can do is to... Make an effort. Well... Go on. That's what you were going to say, wasn't it? No. Well, yes. Well, yes. Yes, I was. Why shouldn't I? It's not something I often ask, is it? Huh. Why shouldn't you make an effort? Why is it only when the family's involved that one needs to make an effort? In all other relationships, things happen in a fairly natural, instinctive way. But with the family, nothing's natural and instinctive. All family occasions just grind to a halt unless everyone involved makes an effort. That's not fair. No, of course it isn't. 
But fairness is another thing that doesn't play much part in family relationships. I don't know why you're being like this, Claire. Nor do I, really. I think it's just... Oh, Christmas puts so much pressure on everyone. It really looms, doesn't it? Yes, it does. I don't remember it looming so much when Daddy was alive. I think it probably did, but in a different way. It had a quick loom three weeks before when it seemed impossible that everything would ever get done in time. But then on the day, everything was more or less all right. Whereas now it just looms, and looms even more because it seems pretty unlikely that everything will be more or less all right on the day. Oh, no, I wouldn't say that. Oh, come on, Mummy. You, me and Granny stuck in the same room all that time. You know what we get like. Yes, yes, I do. But I'm sure Christmas Day can work, even be quite fun. Huh. You know, if we all just relax and... Relax and what? Oh, relax and... Relax and make an effort? Yes. <sighs> Good trick if you can do it. I think that's an excellent idea, Sarah. Good, I'm glad somebody does. No, we've done enough of this gallivanting all over the place at Christmas. Oh, there was only one year that we did. Much better that we should all be together at home. That's what Christmas really should be. Mm. It'll be like Christmases we used to have when you were little. Not exactly like those, I think, Mother. Yes, it will be. We can get back to the correct Christmas Day timetable. What do you mean by the correct Christmas Day timetable? I mean no opening of stockings till 7.30, breakfast at half past eight, church at ten, lunch on the dot of one all cleared away by three in time for the Queen, a brisk walk, then under the tree presents, party games and stimulating conversation in the evening, cold ham and mince pies at an early bed by half past ten. That is the correct Christmas Day timetable. There's nothing correct about that. It's just the way you think it should happen. Yes, well, all right, but that comes to the same thing, doesn't it? Um, and we can get away from some of these little aberrations which have crept into your Christmases over the years. Little aberrations? Things like staying in bed late, not going to church, watching television in the evenings, a certain general slackness of approach to the whole business. Mother, that certain general slackness of approach is the way Henry and I wanted to have our Christmases. What you speak of as little aberrations are things that we worked out together over nearly 20 years of marriage. Well, that still doesn't make them correct, Sarah, dear. But what is all this correct? Where have you got these ideas from? Christmas is primarily a religious festival, you know, Sarah, dear. Christmas is about God. The fact that all too often gets forgotten these days. Yes, all right, it's a religious festival. But nowhere has God written that it is incorrect to have your under-the-tree presents until after you've had a brisk walk on Christmas afternoon. No, well, of course he hasn't written it, but he's implied it. Oh, where? No, honestly, Sarah, your approach to religion is so literal. No, Mother, I know you and God are like that. I know the two of you see eye to eye on absolutely everything. But I think there might come a point when he gets a bit sick of you putting words into his mouth. I'm not putting words into his mouth. I'm not saying anything that isn't common sense. And since God, by definition, must have more common sense than any mere human, then obviously he would agree with what I say. I think there might be a tiny logical flaw in that statement, Mother. Are you accusing God of being illogical? That's blasphemy. No, I'm not accusing God of being illogical. I'm accusing you of being illogical. Oh. I suppose in your terms that's blasphemy too. What? Listen, Mother... I want us all to have a good Christmas. I don't want us to argue. I, I just want us to have a nice time. But, and I'll say this now to avoid any misunderstandings later, I am inviting you and Claire into my bit of the house for Christmas Day. Yes, I know. Which but... means that I will be your hostess, which means that the day will be structured as I think appropriate, and I don't want to have any timetable, correct or otherwise, imposed on it. Is that clear? Very clear, dear. Good. Mind you, I still think you'll find my timetable is the best. You had very good childhood Christmases. Well, I... Oh, you did, dear. No question. My way is the best way. Yes, Mother, I know that has been the basic belief of your whole life. And I know you followed it in a way that makes Frank Sinatra sound positively unsure of himself. But there are certain points on which this Christmas Day may diverge from your blueprint. Oh, dear, what sort of points? Well, for example... I don't think the three of us will be able to get through the whole day without watching television. Sarah, if God had intended people to watch television at Christmas, he'd have put a set next to the manger in Bethlehem. Oh, Mother, don't be ridiculous. Anyway, you always watch television at Christmas. Only when forced to. And my daughter makes me slump in front of some tawdry sitcom. I have little choice. You watch The Queen from choice? That is different, Sarah. I don't watch The Queen because she's on television. I watch her because she's The Queen. 
And if you can't tell the difference between the Queen and a sitcom, then I don't hold out much hope for you. <laughs> Mother! But, Sarah, she isn't actually saying that the whole of your married life was a little aberration. Not in so many words, no. But that implication is always lurking under the surface. Oh, come on. I think you're being a bit, um... What? Paranoid? Yes. No, Russell, there is no such thing as paranoia when you live with my mother. Well, I'm not so sure. I mean, some of the things you say about her are pretty extreme. Oh, but, Russell, remember, paranoia is the delusion that people are trying to get at you. With mother, there's no delusion. It's the real thing. Mm. I'm not paranoid, honestly. She actually is trying to get at me all the time. Well, perhaps. Of course, that's exactly what you would say if you were paranoid. Yes. Yes. Look, don't let's get too involved in that. What I'm saying is that there is, in every mother, however much she pretends otherwise, a secret desire for her children to come back to her. Having found the big bad world too big and too bad. Exactly. Well, in most cases it can remain a little distant gleam of fantasy, but my mother's actually in the position where that fantasy is a potential reality. Except that that doesn't take into account the individuals involved. I mean, you've got far too much personality to subordinate yourself to her in that way. Oh, I know that. <laughs> but what hurts me is when she seems just to wipe out everything that happened from the moment I left home till the moment the two of us started living in the same house again. Henry? Yes. All of Henry. As if my whole marriage, the most important part of my life, the most rewarding part of my life so far, as, as if that were just... A little aberration. Hmm. I shouldn't let it get to me, but sometimes it does. Mm, I'm sure. Well, I don't think that situation's going to change. I mean, all you can do about it is not show her that it's getting to you. At least deny her that satisfaction. You're right. Yes. Oh, incidentally, you know you asked me to keep an eye out for books that might be suitable for Eleanor Stocking. Yes. Well, I had a few thoughts. Um, couldn't find a copy of Machiavelli. If you had, the irony would have been lost on her. Anyway, not much she could learn there. She might be able to teach him a thing or two, though. Anyway, what I did find was... Um, Yes. Perfect, Russell. Yeah. I remember you said, you know, anything about the Queen Mother. Precisely. If there's one thing Mother wants from a book, it's to be able to identify with the characters. Well, I think she has a lousy job. The Queen? Yes. Imagine spending your entire life feigning polite interest in hydroelectric developments. Oh, Claire, I think there's a bit more to it than that. That certainly is, Claire. And I'm very distressed to hear you speaking in this way. I don't like Republican talk under my roof. It isn't Republican talk. Under that, it isn't your roof. I'm not knocking the Queen, Granny. I think she does an utterly thankless job with great dignity. Thankless? Yes. Being polite to people all the time. I couldn't do that. Clearly. I think it must be the worst job in the world. I know you'd hate it, love, but some people do actually like that sort of thing. Who? Well... Politicians do a lot of it, you know. As you said, feigning polite interest in hydroelectric developments. Oh, yes, but they have a motive. They do it for the power. People who do anything for power. But that doesn't apply with the Queen. She can't change the amount of power she's got. From the moment she became Queen, she had all the power the British Constitution was going to allow her. No, she was just lumbered. I can't listen to this. Why not? Well, it's treason. Mother, don't be ridiculous. All Claire is saying is that she wouldn't like to be queen. Very little chance of her ever being asked. Exactly, so it doesn't matter. Everyone's fine. Claire, who doesn't want to be queen, doesn't have to be, and the queen who has to be queen is far too good at the job to let it show, even if she doesn't like it. Mm. Now, could we please get back to where this conversation started, which was, what time are we going to have Christmas lunch? Well, I think the later the better. So do I. You can't possibly start later than one. Why not? Because then you'd have to rush it to be sure it was all tidied up before three. What's so important about having it tidied up before three? The Queen's broadcast, Claire. Here we go again. Well, you can watch it if you want to, Granny. We can move the telly into the dining room. Not unless lunch is all finished and tidied up. Why? Claire, are you suggesting that Her Majesty the Queen should have to put up with our dirty plates and turkey bones? Granny, television only works one way, you know. People can't see out of the set, not even if they're the Queen. I know that, Claire. What I'm talking about is a matter of respect, a concept which you and your generation would probably not understand. I say, fighting talk. Of course I understand the concept of respect, Granny. You could have fooled me. And I respect you, and I respect the Queen. Um, do I get a look in? Yes, I even respect you, Mummy. Oh, thank you. Up to a point. But what I'm saying is I can't respect a television screen. I refuse to dress up or change my behaviour or hurry a meal for a television screen, whoever's appearing on it. Hmm. 
Well, that just demonstrates the kind of lax attitudes... Mother, that... I've seen the solution. What? We have lunch when we want it, when Claire and I want it, and we let it take just as long as we want it to, and we watch the Queen afterwards. Oh. We video the broadcast. Video? The Queen? Sarah, that would be an appalling act of less majesty. Oh, just seemed like a good idea to me. Who's less majesty? Shut up, Claire. Well, Sarah, you've clearly never thought about what being head of state of this country of ours involves. No, well, I suppose I probably haven't much. Why, have you? Oh, yes. Really? To what extent? I mean, have you thought what you'd put in your Christmas broadcast if you were queen? Of course. Oh, <laughs> yeah. What would you put in, Mother? Well, I'd wish all my subjects a happy Christmas. Most gracious. And then I'd mention those who are suffering at this time. Yes, and I'd not forget our friends in the Commonwealth. Very thoughtful. Well, they can't help being foreign. And I'd express my hopes for a prosperous and peaceful new year for the whole world. Yes, in other words, you'd do more or less exactly what the Queen does. Yes. Yes, I suppose I would. We see eye to eye on a lot of things, Her Majesty and I. It's a great pity that we've never had the pleasure of meeting. No, I think she does the broadcast very well. I'm sure she'd be relieved to hear that, Mother. Isn't there anything you'd do different, Granny? You know, if you were Queen and you were doing the Christmas broadcast? Well, I think I'd probably make some reference to personal stereos. What, Mother? You know, those little record player things young people carry around with bits of foam rubber in their ears. Yes, I do know what you mean by personal stereos. I just can't see what they have to do with the Queen's Christmas broadcast. Maybe the Queen has one, secreted in her hat. You know, so she's got something to listen to when she's being shown round hydroelectric development. Claire, don't be frivolous. No, all I mean is that those personal stereos are pernicious. They encourage selfishness. They allow young people to isolate themselves in a world of their own. Yes, but I'm not sure... That... They do. And the noise they make. Sit next to one on the bus and all you can hear is wickaboom, shickaboom, wickaboom. <laughs> it's infuriating. <laughs> Like not quite overhearing enough of someone's conversation to get all the details. Yes, I'm sure you know all about that, Mother. And what I'm saying is that the Queen is uniquely placed to say something about that kind of menace. Just a few well-chosen words from the throne about personal stereos and people would stop using them. I don't think they would. Well, they should. Or be sent to the tower. Oh, goodness. <laughs> you two have such trivial minds. It's impossible to talk to you about anything of real importance. Sorry, sorry. So... We still haven't sorted out when we have Christmas lunch. Mother, are you really insistent on this having everything cleared up before the Queen's broadcast at three business? Sarah, I'd have thought it was no more than common politeness and respect. I mean, the Queen is a very busy person, and if she's prepared to disrupt her Christmas afternoon to address the nation, then the least the nation can do is to see that it's got the washing up done beforehand. Mother? What? The Queen isn't live. What? The Queen's speech is pre-recorded. Don't be ridiculous, Sarah. Well, why can't she just listen to the Queen on the radio? What? The broadcast is on Christmas Day morning, Radio 4, I'm sure. Oh, Russell, that's brilliant, yes. No, she can't argue with that. Still time to get to church if she insists on going, and we can have a nice leisurely Christmas lunch getting quietly pickled into the twilight. And Mother can't make any fuss about hearing it on the radio after all the things she's said about watching television on Christmas Day. She has, in fact, got herself into something of a cleft stick. And Russell Mother spends so much of her time in cleft sticks, it's a wonder she can still stand upright. Mm. You seem uh, relatively breezy about the whole prospect of Christmas. It'll be all right. We'll survive. Incidentally, Russell, I, I know you don't approve of profiting from something you don't believe in. Ah, uh, now, my parents said that. I never did. Good, because I got you this. Oh, Sarah, can I open it? A Christmas presents shouldn't really be open till Christmas Day. Ideally in the afternoon, after a brisk walk. That's it. Still, well, since I don't believe in Christmas Day, and I certainly don't believe in brisk walks... Oh, Sarah, good heavens. It's a first. Wow. I thought you'd like it. It's Heaven, where did you get it? George Linton, Book Lover's Corner. Oh, I, I hope you didn't pay his prices. I beat him down. Oh, good girl. Oh, I'm delighted with it, Sarah. Oh, thanks. The back bedroom may well have to wait until after this gets read. Decorating will always keep. Oh, yes. Oh, incidentally. I know I was brought 
up not to profit from things I don't believe in. Well, it's all right for other people to profit from them, but there you are. But well, should I look inside? Well, I think you can have a peep into the bag without compromising your principles. Whether you actually open it now is between you and the influence of Eleanor's early training. Oh, Russell. Oh, from someone who doesn't believe in Christmas. Well, Bob insisted. He bought all the stuff. I, <laughs> I told him your tiny Tim sob story and he couldn't bear thinking he was so deprived. Oh, well, thank you. Well, you're not going to open it? Oh, good gracious, no. Well, Christmas afternoon, after a brisk walk? No, Russell. Stockings at Christmas morning. Ah. But whatever time you wake up, you're not allowed to start unwrapping until 7.30. Oh. Otherwise you get overtired. Ah. And there are tears before bedtime. Of course. Hey, Mummy, thank you. Ah, oh, still the chocolate orange in the toe. Couldn't let you down on that, could I? Anyway, thanks. I love being treated like a five-year-old. I know. This book about the Queen Mother is quite delightful. I mean, look at that photograph. What a splendid, dignified, truly royal-looking personage. Takes one to know one. What? Nothing. Oh, look! What on earth are those? Hard-boiled quail's eggs. I must say, the things in your stockings do seem a trifle odd, Sarah. Oh, that's Bobby. Never go for anything conventional if he could find an alternative. So I've heard. Last thing right down in the toe. Ah. Oh. What on earth is that? It's a keyring, I think, Mother. Yes, it is. Look, you press that and... Oh. <coughs> How disgusting. Yes, but quite funny. I don't think that vulgarity is ever funny, Sarah. Oh, but Mother, you must admit, when you press this... <laughs> Well, well, <laughs> well, I can see that. that I suppose it could be thought of as mildly amusing uh, in a very common way. Of course, Mother. Anyway, it's the thought that counts. I don't think thoughts of a vulgar kind ever count for much, Sarah. No, of course not. And you'll want a bit of chocolate orange. Oh, thanks. No, oh, thank you, dear. I really think you two should be getting dressed now. What? Well, it'll soon be the broadcast. You weren't thinking of lolling around listening to Her Majesty and your night things, were you? Um, but Granny... You have to have some standards. Yes, yes, of course. What's the time? Well, it's... Oh, goodness, it's nearly half past. Oh, no, we haven't got time to get dressed. No. Oh, dear, you really should have set your alarm earlier, Sarah. Then you'd have had time to make yourself respectable, like me. Yes, you do look very smart, now. Thank you, dear. I still think the hat's a bit much, Granny. We all show respect in our own ways, Claire. Of course. That is, those of us who have any idea of what showing respect means. Listen, Granny, I... Look, it's nearly time. We'd better switch on. Yes. Uh, j just a moment before you do. Claire, at least do your dressing gown up. All right. And empty that mouthful immediately. You can't listen to the Queen with your mouthful. Oh, Mother, she... Quiet, Sarah. And Sarah, for heaven's sake, sit up straight. Better? It'll have to do. You might at least have run a comb through your hair. Now, now don't frown, Claire. <clears throat> Very well, Sarah, dear. You may switch the wireless on now. An almost merry Christmas after Henry. It's coming up to 9.30. In a few moments, after Big Ben, Her Majesty the Queen... This is London. On Christmas Day, the Queen speaks to the people of the Commonwealth wherever they may be. Her Majesty the Queen. Sooner or later, we all become aware of the passing of the years. But every now and then, we get a sharp reminder that time is moving on rather quicker than we expected. This happened to me last month when we celebrated our 40th wedding anniversary. I was very touched that so many of you were kind enough to send messages of good wishes. There is no point in regretting the passage of time. Growing older is one of the facts of life, and it has its own compensations. Experience should help us to take a more balanced view of events, and to be more understanding about the foibles of human nature. Like everyone else, I learn about what is going on in the world from the media. But I am fortunate to have another source of information. 
Every day, hundreds of letters come to my desk, and I make a point of reading as many of them as I possibly can. The vast majority are a pleasure to read. There are also sad ones from people who want help. There are interesting ones from people who want to tell me what they think about current issues, or who have suggestions to make about changing the way things are done. Others are full of frank advice for me and my family, and some of them do not hesitate to be critical. I value all these letters for keeping me in touch with your views and opinions, but there are a few letters which reflect the darker side of human nature. It is only too easy for passionate loyalty to one's own country, race, or religion, or even to one's favourite football club, to be corroded into intolerance, bigotry, and ultimately into violence. We have witnessed some frightening examples of this in recent years. All too often, intolerance creates the resentment and anger which fill the headlines and divide communities and nations and even families. From time to time, we also see some inspiring examples of tolerance. Mr. Gordon Wilson, whose daughter Marie lost her life in the horrifying explosion at Enniskillen on Remembrance Sunday, impressed the whole world by the depth of his forgiveness. His strength and that of his wife and the courage of their daughter came from their Christian conviction. All of us will echo their prayer that out of the personal tragedies of Enniskillen may come a reconciliation between the communities. There are striking illustrations of the way in which the many different religions can come together in peaceful harmony. Each year, I try to attend the Commonwealth Day Interfaith Observance at Westminster Abbey. At that service, all are united in their willingness to pray for the common good. This is a symbol of mutual tolerance, and I find it most encouraging. Of course, it is right that people should hold their beliefs and their faiths strongly and sincerely. But perhaps we should also have the humility to accept that while we each have a right to our own convictions, others have a right to theirs too. I'm afraid that the Christmas message of goodwill has usually evaporated by the time Boxing Day is over. This year, I hope we will continue to remember the many innocent victims of violence and intolerance and the suffering of their families. Christians are taught to love their neighbors, not just at Christmas, but all the year round. I hope we will all help each other to have a happy Christmas and when the new year comes, resolve to work for tolerance and understanding between all people. Happy Christmas to you all.